Good evening, viewers, and welcome to the Gildari Freddy Kisun show. I am your fitting host this evening, and we have uh, a guest with us who is no um, stranger to this program, and his name is Joel Bagwindin. Um Again, we are just fitting in for Freddie and Gildari since um, they have been uh, unable to make it. I would want to think we would be able to create um, a fairly good atmosphere in light of the kind of controversy um, myself and <coughs> Joel brings to media in Guyana. So welcome, Joel, um, to the program. Thank uh, you. Uh, you've been here more than me, so <laughs> <laughs> so um, Joel, I think what's going to be interesting because I don't know if you know, and it might be a fault on my part. I have never um, one time, and as, as a result of what you said just now. Um, one of the programs that I was really interested in watching with you is with yourself and the economists out of the PNC camp. And you said, <laughs> it's you, Tom, not me. You're the worst nightmare, Elson Lowe, right? So I am, um, just to go back a bit and help me with an understanding and maybe some views out there. Give us a little bit about yourself and why, how you're here, not on the program, but as Joel Bagwindin, the accountant, how you're here today. All right. So <clears throat> good evening, viewers, and um, thank you again for having me on, on short notice. Um, <clears throat> you know, but I'm not, I'm not new to these impromptu type of stuff. So right into the question, how, how I'm here. I, I won't call myself an accountant. I'm not an accountant. I'm a, a more a business and finance professional. It's a little bit different type of training. Okay. Though you cover some bit of accounting and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so I started my my entire, to give a quick summary, my entire career has been in the financial sector. So I've worked, first started in, in, in banking, central bank, came out of, Came out of Central Bank, worked with a with the Private Sector Commission as the economic analyst. Um, worked with a global professional services firm at, at the senior management level in the advisory business, again in finance, financial advisory. And now I've fast forward to today. Um, I have my own company with myself and my wife in the same business, advisory in corporate finance. And um, I've strategically positioned that company as a as a as an intelligence and analytics company which is what i do a lot in the media so i how i got here i work hard didn't come from a rich family come from very humble can we beginnings. well can yeah. we go back a little more <laughs> yes a little more personal I, can we go back I, there i am yeah. not accustomed to to one of my weaknesses is, is talking about myself but as, as you insist i come from very um, humble beginnings you know my my family came from the they made their living in, in farming in the sugar industry um, they've worked hard they didn't grow up without luxuries um, I would say that they struggled to send me to school to ensure that I get all of my books um, I don't miss a day at school you know took care of me I, I didn't feel the struggle but my parents did um grew up in a very traditional home not a fancy home that we're living in now so we come from a very poor um we've also been we've all and i've said this in different forums um <clears throat> other forums um and i think it's important as you asked me to go back a, a little bit you know because i if i'm to say i dabble somewhat in politics in terms of my analysis you know i i I, economics, finance, and politics, they all they, they integrate, right? To really bring context and perspective for the readers to understand. You can't explain public finance without understanding 
the political economy and without understanding how the political economy informs the economic rationale. And, you know, historically, and I've talked about this many times and written about this, and this is not, this is indisputable facts. You know, historically, we've come from, from an era, several periods in our history of political, politically motivated crime and violence. And um, my family uh, have been victims of political violence in the in the in the village that I grew up. You know, every year, while it, throughout the entire year we live in harmony, but it is a predominantly the village of itself is predominantly, you know, favors the the opposition. But my family who live in this village alone is perhaps the only supporter of known supporter of, of the government of the day and it has been so for many years and every election something always happen we have key and farms you know key and land burned down one time uh, i can remember i was a little boy growing up you know they break, broke into our home destroy everything you know and, and people went to jail my father when 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 was i don't know if he went into jail but he and some others who took responsibility for whoever broke into the home, you know, spent a few nights in the, in the, in the lockup. You know, so that's the history I came from. So do you think that, <clears throat> do you think that that has impacted you in a manner, you're aware of the struggles, do you think that has Im played a, a, an instrumental role in the drive uh, that you have uh, that's behind you uh, to succeed at what you do? I think I think it has. I mean, we came here to talk about the state of, of affairs, and I thought into an interview. <laughs> no, but it is but it's, it it's, is yeah. the state of affairs because <laughs> it's what you're what's talking happening. about, what you what we're talking about, um, is directly linked, um, you know, to how people are affected. And as you said, rightfully said before, you can't consider economics, and you don't consider the political situation. And you don't consider history. Um, Aubrey Norton sat here once and said history is not in a, it doesn't run in a straight line, right? He was dissatisfied with um, how things would have been going or how the interview was going, and that was his assessment of things. So we can't go. No, certainly, without... certainly, I agree. I just I, I'm just cognizant of the viewers. I mean, the viewers would come expecting to hear the discussion, but putting it into context. Um, um, so. Coming back to the question, did it play a role? Did it? Did it? Was it instrumental? You know, in reflecting on it, I have been asked this question not so long ago by a mentor, one of my mentors, uh, about a few weeks ago, about a month ago. And the answer that came to mind, I think, is yes, and yes because I. Have had opportunities to lead this country. My, in the period, and, and this is going to be very personal, in the period 2015 to 2020, uh, I could not see a future in this country. I could not see a future. So, 2015 to 2020? Let's say 2015 to 2019. And I'll tell you why. Because of history, even though I know that this government would win the elections, I know that it would be a difficult task to get that government out. And, and I'm not saying these things for the first time. If you follow, I've been writing a column in Guyana Times. I've, I've written about these things. So anybody could Google my, my writings and see that I've written about these things. Among, of course, many others who study and understand our history. And so when you start to see from the point where the the, the unilateral appointment of of, of, of um, partisan of partisan, in fact before that, when I started to get worried, the former president the former president was in the U.S. speaking to Guyanese diaspora, predominantly that party's support base in the U.S. and he made certain remarks and I wrote a column referencing that. And he said certain things subtly. 
and he was telling these people i don't know if he, if he didn't know that this thing was being televised and covered you know you know to the open the press and he was saying to them that recall how we what we did in the past to retain to retain power and the whole conversation was centered around how the, his government in the past historically has retained power and we all know how that government retained power <clears throat> in the past and then you see these appointments of of retired military officers in so many different positions you know i was actually doing an exercise collecting a database of all these different heads also the pattern was 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 very there was a there was a deliberate pattern a deliberate trend and i was not convinced that even though if this government win the election that it would be a humongous task to get them out and then that was me taking out my intellectual ability to analyze things then when i kick into my analytical my analytical mind you know remove the emotive the emotional feelings and so on and I, I i write about these i wrote about these things as well i said listen if when i start to look at the geopolitics of the region the role now that the us has to play and i start to study these things now because i'm very worried for us going back to his, history repeating itself i comforted my intellectual analysis comforted me to some extent that i was convinced that the international community particularly the us would not allow guyana to become a pariah state stability is critically important why because this region this entire region is their backyard venezuela is already out of control and they cannot afford when you look at the many different regions in which they are fighting wars and deploying resources can they afford to fight a war in their own backyard can they afford to destabilize their backyard or allow it to destabilize without their intervention so i was comforted by that fact that um you know there there's going to be some intervention coming down to the elections period i was at a private sector commission at that time and the private sector commission was a major stakeholder as an observer in the elections and when we see what started to take place and post elections i had many many sleepless nights many sleepless nights and i was so worried and and i don't know where where this country is going to head and even you would not believe this senior private sector leaders big men who has who i think has far more wisdom in 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 politics and our history and all of this would have some level of and, and of course have have access to um have different level of conversations with the opposition leader then um and president in waiting then now president and opposition leader then now vice president you know they would have have had some confidence but when they come and they sit in a meeting room and i'm there the insecurity the nervousness the distress you know worried me worried me all i could think of how can i jump on the a insecurity and the nervousness yeah. by um, everybody in private the sector everybody in individuals the exactly and i'm a mere employee and if these men are insecure i depend on them to employ me mm. what ha- imagine what happens to the employee mm. and i'll tell you when my confidence level reboot my confidence level reboot after these guys were on the brink of uh, on the verge of 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 you know of crashing mentally literally they asked for a meeting with your well now vice president i was a virtual meeting because we were in the height of of covid and i was in that meeting and when i listened to this when i listened to him speak how he was so calm and so composed you know i grew up studying from since i was a common entrance student in primary school i've been reading about politics since then 
So when I listen to, to him speak, even though some of the private sector leaders were still not confident, I was absolutely confident because listening to him, I don't know if it was my analytic ability, I instantly recognized that this guy is a hundred step ahead of the game in the sense that he already calculated every single move that the APNO would, 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 would play and he already had plan A, B, C, D, how to counter that and how to deal with that. And so that, you know, gave me some confidence. Come back, come back now to a little bit personal in 2018. Because I couldn't see this future, my wife, who I have a family, a beautiful family with today, she was a student of mine and she was involved in, a, in, a, in another relationship which didn't work out well for her. And so in 2018, I met her and um, she was basically looking to looking for security and settle down and she was broken and all of these things and i said to her you know i i can be plain with you i can't give you a future in this country i can't see a future i work in right now to sell sponsorship to canada and that was the end of the conversation and i never hear back from she never hear back never see she back rejected her in 2018 2020 when we then succeeded, and I remember vividly that afternoon when the president was sworn in, it was like an entire, like this entire, the weight of the entire universe was lifted. And then two days after I started to reflect, I said, well, listen, I, I am not, I'm gonna make a conscious decision to stay in this country. Because once these guys are in power, I know they know how to manage an economy. That's all I need, you know. I don't need favors or anything. Once you know how to manage the economy, I know how to make money, right? I know how to propel my career. And so my decision was to stay, stay here, build a future here, and do whatever I can. And this is why I write and do these programs to help them as well, to succeed in their goals. And then, <coughs> I don't know if the stars aligned. I went and I look for my wife who I rejected in 2018. I, after about two years, I, I found her and she was still, you know, she was still available and, and the rest is history. If it would, if it would make any difference, um, because I myself, uh, my frustration started a little way back in like about uh, 2050. I, I campaigned for the PNC. I don't say APNU because they have reinvented themselves so many times. It was the PNC, then the PNCR, <coughs> and they've reinvented themselves so many times with the intention of creating this persona that does not exist. Mm -hmm. um, so I gave up business. I literally fell apart. My relationship ended. I had an 18-year marriage um, to the mother of my three sons. And that ended 2015, 2016, because the pressure was too much. And I could not have seen uh, a future with the PNC. So I came out and worked tirelessly, uh, you know, with the programs and highlighting issues and all that kind of thing. Because of the fact that I campaigned for them, I tried to hold them accountable and hope that they would have changed something. Um, that happened my that happened as a result of my naivety and my inexperience with politics. So I've been around, I, I can remember being a, a little boy when um, PNC supporters were running down Regent Street. I was on my first... Um, experience with riots and looting was standing at the corner of light and region streets and I, I think they went into brands right or something like that to break into a store and within minutes everything was ravaged from that store women running with fridge on the head and that kind of thing it was you know i was and i was lost I, I wasn't in fear because i did not know how dangerous that was i was confused um <coughs> why human beings would have been acting this way and this is the more fire slow fire days right the days of Desmond Hoyt. 
um then time that all the roads was in holes and the things that we talk about now and a lot of times the things that you get even in the recent uh, pnc government the pnc government of the past was a disaster and the pnc government of the future of the recent past was a disaster but just on a different level because one has to ask oneself how can you be a disaster in the 21st century <laughs> where you could get all the support and find it. You understand? They could not. They ain't good at maths. They can't match the maths, right? Because people don't know. The development that you're seeing today in Guyana is as a result of foresight. And <coughs> now, I, I don't think it is only now, within the last few months, we've started spending oil money. Mm -hmm. The literal oil money, right? So, and you can't plan this in a day. You have to, what is happening and what is rolling out now in the economy was planned a year ago. So you would have had to have force and say, well, well, I will get that money, but you got to plan ahead. And they could have planned ahead because they could have been rolling out this. They could have taken loans. They could have maneuvered. They just didn't care. The, the, the um, PNC the past. But if it's to give you any um, bit of credence, I felt like I could not have survived with them. I felt like I was stifling. I, I, I was suffocating um, under PNC administration. So I spoke out. Um, I chose because I had experiences of the past with the PUP. I was literally thrown out of Freedom House. That's why I chose Third Force. I am a supporter of Third Forces. No PBP, no PNC. I just had um, a bad experience with politics in general. So I support Third Force to create some sort of balance. Then it came down to, I, I started, I can remember being at Kaicho News and saying, um, I'd like to interview Barrett Jagdio. And everybody was like, what? You could interview Barrett Jack? Do you know who is Barrett Jack? Do you know who is this man? And I was like, I... He speaks, he answers questions. And yes, I just want to throw questions at him. Because I got a unique interviewing mm -hmm. method. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. I allow you into it and then I go straight ahead into it. Um, and I can't explain how like you could have explained you were in the office i can't explain how i attained a certain level of confidence and understanding from bar jagdio but i got it because i got frustrated everybody calls me so we call a critic we're going on this country right we want we do let me do something yes sir and I can remember times I would call uh, Dr. Roger Luncheon and say, you know, people are ready for move. Things, things need to happen. And reassurance would be gotten, no, everything is going to be okay. Don't worry. Calm, calm. Uh, Jagdeo has always had, have this calm demeanor. It's, that in itself is frustrating because... You can't tell me that me seeing madness. Are you watching me and tell me, no, cool, it's going to be okay. You know what I'm saying? i like, man, this, mm. the, you there with the PNC. What's your program, buddy? You see these people want to rig this election. You see these people want to take over this place. And this banners be like, no, it's okay. Everything <coughs> is going to be okay. So I would want to think, I, I would confirm that he's been 100 steps ahead all the time. You see, if, <clears throat> here I tell you, it's so serious I could go for it. I think sometimes he's playing their game. I honestly think, this is in my honest opinion, that Jagdew, Barra Jagdew, does be playing out the PNC game. I don't think the PNC runs the PNC. Mm. It is highly likely. It's a possibility. It's highly likely. Mm. You understand? I could tell you though, mm. with some bit of certainty, that this game that is played on the PNC side is manipulated and controlled by Barajagi. 
he's <clears throat> he it is true that he's very sophisticated at a, to the point that you mentioned you know i i i am part of several groups diaspora group and so on right and not only you but even supporters of the PPP and people who were part of the party party members I'm aware have been frustrated what is man doing what is man doing you know was in you know we did because he is so calm and the thing about it he is a true politician in the sense and the best politician perhaps in the region the best political strategist because the, the, you know those quotes that we post and we like to talk about and post on social media, those fancy quotes, but we don't live by it. He lived by certain quotes, certain principles, rules and philosophies. Because the reason why he's, he's um, so calm, there is a quote that says, there's three things that you mustn't, you must never disclose in life. Your income, your personal life, your love life, <coughs> and most importantly, and this, he is very good at this, your next move. Never tell anybody what is your next move. So he already modeled all the moves in his head, but only he knows it, nobody else. And that's how he succeed. That's how he succeed. So... We're there halfway into the program. Let's get straight into a better understanding of a feel and an area that um, I think you thrive on. The economical situation of Guyana today compared to the economical situation of Guyana five years ago, and why so? <coughs> five years ago. Could we go further? we go further and I want to put it in the recent context and juxtapose it back to the debate that never happened that we supposed to have in this platform with um, with Elson Lowe right one of the main topics at that time that Elson and I was supposed to debate was this whole thing about this Dutch disease right and today everybody talking about Dutch disease and resource cars and so on right a few recently last week some Jamaican economist and I eventually found out after I respond several pieces <coughs> I subsequently found out that the guy is actually he he has uh, ties to the AFC the opposition um, he's associated He's, he's, he's associated with some known advisors to the AFC back when they were in government. And when you look at the timing and calculation of this comment, the WPA guy that made the comment about violence and arms and turned the gun, <coughs> I respond to it. I did a letter. And this guy came out same time. Was it by accident? It couldn't be. Not based on what I found out now. It was not by accident and he said well Guyana will suffer this Dutch disease this natural risk there is two concepts natural resource cars and Dutch disease and they're they're slightly different in 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 mean in that by definition by the way from from my understanding I can explain it no but I understand it I can tell you it is total out of context in Guyana's situation Absolutely. and how if you ask a Guyanese what it means, what the Dutch disease, and I'm not telling you the regular Guyanese, I'm not telling you about the layman. Mm. You ask even people who are economists, they are unable to explain it. Really and truly, it's being thrown around loosely mm. to create an environment in Guyana like Guyana is going to fall apart. Mm. Right? So, mm. yeah, so he, well, he did exactly that. And the guy's a PhD economist, you know, lecturing at Uri and so on. So Gara will suffer this and the political parties will squabble. And he made a comment which resembles that of the infamous WPA remark that it is worth killing people for power. Why would you make such a comment when in the midst of this happening, knowing of our 
political sensitivities and our history. If you're an economist, lecturing at UE, you have to know of our history. Why would he make such an inflammable comment? And they think, you know, it. I flipped, I flipped the nerve and I do, did three, four responses within 24 hours. Brutal responses, aggressive responses that I have no regret in how it was written and how it was put forward because it's a blatant disrespect to us. He did no analysis. He talks about weak institutions, for example. First of all, he confused, he conflated the concept of that disease or natural resource. He didn't understand what it is. Clueless. But for the argument's sake, he talked about weak institutions. Because we have weak institutions, we will not achieve these goals. We won't go anywhere. But look at where we came from. In 19, in the early 80s, I was doing some research, incidentally, which came in useful, going back, pulling data from way back in the 70s and 80s, to look at a different period of tra economic transformation, because there were different periods when the economy was driven by different aspects. There was a time when we were a socialist, driven by mining, gold, agriculture, sugar, now oil and gas, right? So, in the early 80s, our GDP, the GDP of this country, the value of this country, was 600 million US. By 1992, GDP shrunk, it contracted by 40%, by 40% to 300 and 370 something million US, right? So we weren't going up, we going down from the 80s to the 90s. The, the, the size of the national debt, when we talk about bankruptcy, bankruptcy means you've got so much debt that you can't afford to pay it. So the debt to GDP ratio in 1992 was almost 600%. That means the size of the debt of the country was six times the size of the economy. You understand? So it means all the money that you bring in in revenue is not enough to service your debt. So we, so we came out of that um, period by, by the man who played an instrumental role is the man who we talk about earlier on the program. And <clears throat> how did we came out of this period? Economic transformation. We came out of a socialist economy, a socialist-driven system. We had to strengthen our institutions. We had to recalibrate our institutions that were set up to run a socialist regime, now to move to a market economy. So, so we had to rely on, on privatizing a lot of state-owned state industries, and we also had to fight for debt forgiveness. And, and the vice president in his days as finance minister and president played a huge, huge role. And people don't talk about this. Every day people beat him up about Skeldon and this. and But nobody is appreciative of the fact that he has negotiated. He went all over. In fact, people trivialize it. People trivialize and say, oh, he go with the bag and bowl and ask him. But if he did not do that, you and I would not have been here today. We, this the clothes that we have on here today, this phone, we got to get foreign currency to pay for this because it's imported. We don't produce it here. So we would not have had clothing, the building materials that we import, we wouldn't have if we money. Stayed, basically, if we stayed on the trajectory that we were in the 90s yes. under the PNC, we, we would have been like <coughs> Venezuela today. And exactly. remember, Venezuela has had their interventions um, as a result of being stifled by America causing that. But that would have happened naturally to us because mm -hmm. being small and the debt, the burden we had, basically. Correct. So looking, before I move off from that history, and I made this argument, when you look at the definition of the natural resource curse, the definition of the natural resource curse states that a country that is rich in natural resources is not today. We got the I'll be in the early time. We got gold and bauxite and forestry and we got all the resources. We come and we reach it, the natural resources, right? So we always had it. And what did we do post 
independence. Post independence, we had a dictatorial socialist regime. We were unable to successfully harness those resources, monetize those resources. And so the theory of the natural resource curse says that natural resource rich countries, oftentimes they concentrate, they depend on a few industries. And as a result of that, there is no economic growth. And that is exactly what happened. I should, you look at the numbers. <clears throat> there was a downward trajectory right down to bankruptcy. That's so we came out of an era when we were we were brought out of natural, an era, correct? Of we a were, form of, <clears throat> of resource course, correct? So we the natural resource course is not new to us. We've been through this this already. We don't have to. Oh, people are saying, oh, look at Trinidad for lessons and when all the lessons in the world we experience it from our post independence history. Now, what is the Dutch disease? The Dutch disease is slightly different, but the end result is the same thing. You break up the economy. Just like how if a man dies, the, man, the end result is he died, but the cause of death could be many different things. He could die by being hit down by a car in an accident. He get a heart attack and die. So many different things could be the cause of death. Same thing when we're speaking about the economy. We could kill the economy. We could, we could run down the economy. That is the end result. That is the consequence over a period of time. But the cause of it, this is the difference between natural resource curse and Dutch disease. So we talk about a natural resource curse. Now what is the Dutch disease? The Dutch disease is when you have a change in relative price. Now what does that mean? So we're an open economy. We buy and we sell goods, we export and we import goods. So the stability of the dollar is linked to the stability of your exchange rate, right? So if there is any significant movement in the exchange rate, it means you're going to have a significant impact on if you're importing goods, you're going to have a significant impact. Either you save money or you pay more for your imports, depending on how the exchange rate moves. And same for exports. And even an individual, if you're using a credit card to shop online, and today you pay $200 for US to buy something, and the next week you go, you're paying $220. It's, it's a big difference, right? So that is what a Dutch disease is. When there is a change in, re <coughs> change in relative price, you have a sh substantial appreciation in the exchange rate. And so, and this happens when you have an abundance of resources. So one resource bringing a whole lot of foreign currency inflows into the economy. So the exchange rate, it, it also depends on the type of exchange rate policy the country um, has. And so there was a time when we had a fixed exchange rate policy. This was in the socialist days. And now we have a floating exchange rate where the exchange rate is determined based on demand and supply. That is how prices work. That is how market forces work. Basic, basic understanding, basic fundamentals. So naturally, if you're going to have billions of US dollars flowing into the system, then you have you flooding the market with foreign currency. What's going to happen to exchange rate? You're going to have a sharp appreciation. Exchange rate could move from, you know, what was our exchange rate in 1992? $112. Before then, it was in way back. It was four dollars, and then it start it started to it started to devalue four dollars, eight dollars, twenty, thirty, hundred and twelve dollars, and then to where it landed, right? I don't want to go into that how it was devalued. It it has to do with it had to do with the state of the economy then. So, imagine now if we have this sharp appreciation to go back to nineteen ninety two from two hundred now two hundred eight now to one hundred and twelve where we were. Imagine what that's going to do to our, ex to our export commodities. Our non-oil exports is $1.3 billion. If you do the math and you do the, the move the change, the difference between the two adjustments, it's a loss of over $100 billion. If the, if the exchange rate appreciates, exports is going to, it means the domestic currency becomes stronger against the US dollar, which means the people who are exporting, the manufacturers exporting the ice cream and the DDL exporting the rum, it becomes more expensive in the international market. So they become less competitive in the international market. So what happens if you become less less competitive? Your, your, your product becomes more expensive. 
you will have a drop in sales. So what happens on the import side? Our import bill is $4.3 billion as of 2021. So what happens to, to that? Your, the import bill in G dollars at $208 is 900 and something billion G dollars. So the importers are gonna save a substantial sum north of 400 billion if using this scenario that we create, this example that we create, importers are gonna save because imports are gonna become cheaper because you're paying less for the foreign currency to pay for imports. So all of a sudden imports become cheap for the importers. But guess what happens? What happens in business? Do you think the importers are gonna pass on that savings to the consumers? No. Perhaps they might do to some extent, but to a large extent, they're unlikely to do that, which means they're going to get richer. It goes to their bottom line, their profit. So what happens? Exports becomes more expensive. The DDL rum that we export becomes more expensive. Sales start to decline. Banks DIH start to decline. Sterling start to decline. Bihari start to decline. All the exporters start to decline. Forestry gold start to decline. Importers going up, they get in richer. So one, you kill one sector at the expense of another. What happens when you kill, let's say, this non-oil export sector employ 200,000 Guyanese? They're going to eventually be out of job if these companies start to go down. What happens to the economy? Back to square one. Joel, if I may add to that, um, and I think, you know, persons like this, I haven't heard anybody say it. Um, the concept of the Dutch disease came from somewhere. And what nobody is considering is the fact that it is not a natural disaster. So natural disasters are within no one's control. Correct. It is not a natural disaster. Nobody has gone back to look at what the government was doing at the time in that country when they would have attracted the Dutch disease or a natural resource course, right? This is a very prudent government. You're seeing what their abilities are. And I have seen what the PNC did from 2015 to 2020. And I'm telling you, I feel that the likelihood of what is being touted as the natural resource course and the Dutch disease, it would have been more likely under PNC administration. Not to say it's impossible, but government, as you say, you, you're talking about supply demand, um, import export, and how we could be affected or how it works. Adjustments can be made if it is noticed that in the economy we are going to be affected in a certain manner. And it's constantly made. You want me to tell you which one we would have had under them? You want me to tell you which one we had under them? So I just now differentiate what is the difference between the natural resource course and the Dutch disease, right? <clears throat> Their track record is the natural resource course, not the Dutch disease. We would have been safe from the Dutch disease if they were in power. I'll tell you how. And the reason for that is because they have a competent governor of the central bank. I explain demand and supply, right? So one might ask the question, so we have a billion dollars in oil, in oil revenue, U.S., and we have all this money in the banking sector sitting. How is it we don't have this appreciation? And it comes back to how the market operates and how the central bank is managing the managing monetary policy, managing the exchange rate to avoid a situation of the Dutch disease. So the central bank has international reserve. They have foreign currency reserves, which is held abroad. The commercial banks also have foreign currency balances held abroad. You would, people might not know this, but I saw the governor did something smart and he was saving the economy from those incompetent 
fiscal government at the time when he made the move to open this to, to to go to the fed to set up the natural resource fund <clears throat> and something else he went to the fed for i can't remember exactly but why was that a smart move because once you have access to the fed the u.s federal reserve bank the fed the federal reserve bank does not have all these stipulations and restrictions like the imf would right so, for example, if we had a foreign currency crunch, we had a real shortage of foreign currency, and we needed to inject foreign currency into the system, we have an option. We could go to the IMF, and the IMF could lend us some foreign currency to inject in the short term. But there, because of the function of the IMF, they're a, they're a macroeconomic institution. They, they're set up to bail countries out that mismanage their economy and went bankrupt. And they come in, they bring all these loans, they implement all these reforms. That's their function. So once you have, you go to them to borrow any money, whether for short term or, or medium term, to, to reboot your economy, to, take it, to turn it around, it comes with a set of, restrictions and rules and so on and you gotta implement this and implement a whole bunch of stuff the fed you need six million ten million whatever there's no restriction you get to borrow it and you could replenish right so the, because of the central bank and how this and because the central bank independently manages the foreign reserve of the country and the commercial banks for years now have been you know if you got excess money you got your house already your bank account got some money, you take care of all of your bills, everybody got enough money. What do you do with your excess? Do you leave it in a bank account sitting, doing nothing? Or do you put it to work by investing it to bring in more money? That's how you create wealth. So these institutions now, they take these excess money that is sitting, not doing anything, and they're invested. They buy government bonds, treasury bills in other countries, and they make some profits back home, which is come back, which comes back here. So because of that operation, that is what is helping us from staving off the Dutch disease. So we have, for example, the Bank of Ghana Reserve, as of January, was 932 million US. But all of that is not available. Some is invested. The commercial banks have 446 million US dollars in net foreign asset. But all of that is not available because about 90% of that is invested abroad in, in instruments. And then we have the money in the natural resource fund. It's not within the market it's sitting in the fed and so because of how we set it up and how we're managing the foreign currency inflows and all these different parts that is why we do not have the dutch disease so imagine if we didn't have a natural resource fund and we bring all the money put it in the central bank here and we flood the market with the system flood flood the market with with foreign currency we can have the dutch disease right so under them we would not have had the Dutch disease because of the market, how the market operate itself, which they have least to do with. Um, but we would have had a natural resource curse because if you listen to them, and you could go on the internet now, you could go on the internet now and Google, do a research from 2015 to 2019 and listen to Jordan, listen to Winston Jordan, and listen to the former president. The men, all they do is build a couple roads and put up a couple arch, right? No development, no bridge, no energy, not, no major transformational development. Oh, we're waiting on the early source. Agric you're not hearing nothing about agriculture and, and tourism, nothing. Oh, when we get the oil money, when we get the oil money, when we get the oil money. They would have, they would have made some disastrous moves. <laughs> With the little that they had, look at how they basically true the sugar workers to the dogs they could not and people were thinking here what happened the truth is and if if you know we gotta be truthful about this and um, because it's, it's matter of fact um even now the now administration is struggling to save the sugar industry because they're pumping a lot of money into it but the PNC did not see the sugar industry for what it is. It's Guyanese people. They saw the sugar industry as something they were putting money into. And they're incapable 
of coming up with new ideas of acquiring finances. So them closing the sugar industry, the, the, the PPP administration or the PPP opposition at the time was able to use that against them as is a result of them um, not caring for the people. But the truth is, I'm willing to give them some bit of credence. The closing the sugar industry came from their incompetence because they're not creative. They are not um, driven by an understanding of the economy. If you listen to Aubrey Norton, if you listen to the opposition leader, if you listen to even the, their economist, um, Elsa Lowe, um, they're very inept. They, they, they don't understand exactly what is going on. So the PVP was able to use the closing of the estates and say, well, they put 7,000 workers because the PVP looking for the votes. They're looking mm -hmm. to, to, to say. And that is actually what happened. They put 7,000 workers on the streets, actually 10,000. 7,000 from um, Barbies and 3,000 from West Demerara. But the truth is, it's a matter of fact, and you saw that with everything else. Their incompetence did not allow them to find ways. You know, people are saying, oh, the PPP is pouring money into the sugar estate. And that is a matter of fact. The subsidies, it's, it's heavily subsidized to keep the people going. And West Demerara, a lot of PNC people. And not only the persons who work with the estate, but also people in the environs because it came down to women, children going to school. It came down to the shops, the economy, right? The village economy. The village economy. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't know that the estates and, and Gaisuko is the main factor behind the maintenance of drainage in, in most of the backlands, right? Across this country. The PNC was incapable of doing anything that would stimulate the economy to ensure the survival. So people say the PNC now is crying, oh, the PVP putting money into it. But one has to ask oneself where they get the money from. And if you are governing for a people and there is some bit of saving, shouldn't we put that to save those people? Nobody's checking that. They did not care. They were just looking at numbers that they did not understand, by the way, and thinking, well, here, we ain't got money and we can't keep putting money into this, right? They did not look at the long-term effects, what crime would have done, what crime would have been like with 10,000 hardened men. Nobody paying attention to the cane cutters are hardened men. You ever see a cane cutting operation? You understand? Cane cutters are lined up in one of the hardest jobs in this country. Because you know what a cane cutter does when he's out of crop? You know, Joel? You know, fisherman. Mm -hmm. Hard job. You understand? Ain't no easy job. You got to go and watch them ban a hand that does a hard job. What do you think they do when their back is against the wall? You understand? The only thing they would have turned to if they can't get jobs, and not all of them, um, a lot of them go cane cutters, do mason work and all these kind of things. But a lot would have turned to crime because cane cutters are also heavy drinkers. <laughs> so they would be impulsive mm. in acting on this thing. Um, the, the suicide rate would have gone up because of the areas that these jobs were lost at. So I, I know people personally who commit suicide, but it was not only their incompetence it's a combination of their incompetence and their political prerogative now there is something the, the argument that you're putting in all these subsidy every year it's 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 a flawed argument because uh, let me explain it simply right you 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 elaborate it and you you talk about it in a layman way that money putting money into the sugar keeping the sugar estates going is sustaining the, the community the fishermen the taxi the people the vendors of the market they, they come to town, they buy, they pay taxes, they pay VAT, all these things. So it's not money just going in and it ain't coming back. When you do elementary economics, they teach you about the circular flow economy. 
which means the money circulating within the same economy. So let me give you a simple demonstration. If I pay you now $5,000 for this phone, right? That's you, I paying you $5,000 money coming out from my pocket, going to your pocket. And then you see, uh, this is a nice bond you got here. How much for it? 5000 You give me back the 5000 and I give you the bond. The same thing. Same thing. So the estate of itself has to import materials. They got to pay taxes, but the employees got to pay PAYE. They got to pay NIS. So the money flows back to the treasury. That is excluding the indirect impact on the on thousands of dependents. The money goes back to the treasury. So now that you're draining this treasury and they go in somebody's bank account or somebody's pocket and it never it's leaving, it's leaving. Yeah. You're like, you know, at, the, at that operational level, funny enough, at the estate level, because it was mostly cane cutters, right away, straight to the shop, man, this is eating out. You understand? That there wasn't a big saving there. Mm. That went back into the circular economy immediately. 99% of it. You had small mm. amounts of that money would have been saved and would have been taken out of the economy. And that also would have been a support mechanism. Even if it's saved in the bank, the bank used that savings to then add create loans. Right? So, <coughs> so they I, didn't understand how the economy works, but but politically, it was more political as well. Because their own people, they paid $50 million, $50 million taxpayers' money to Clive Thomas to do a commission of inquiry. And Clive Thomas concluded, do not close the estates. Do not close the estates. He never recommended the closure of any estates. What he recommended, he recommended diversification. He recommended monetizing some aspects like the irrigation and so on. He recommended further studies. Um, social economic um, impact studies and these type of stuff so he didn't recommend the closure at least at that point and as soon as he submit this they, they tell the people oh we did a commission of inquiry the minister submit some white paper and the white paper didn't draw anything from the commission of inquiry report the white paper was a cut and paste document no more than 10 pages the most poorly done cut and paste document presented to the national assembly a whole set of fluff. Oh, we gotta close the estate. Do you? Um, what are they? And and we're just about to the program to complete the program. But what are your projections for the economy? What can Guyanese expect? <coughs> Being somebody um, well read in the area, what Guyanese can expect? And um, you know. Guyanese, from the analytic point of view, I don't want to say what Guyanese can expect. We are at the point the government is over two and a half years in 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 office. They have, they have honored their promises demonstrably, tangibly, and what you talk earlier about foresight and they think about this perhaps a year ago. Actually, the, all these things that are happening now, all these development bridge across, are because are were development that were held back that was supposed to have happened two decades ago, which is articulated in the 1996 development strategy for the country. And I've talked about this many times. So the question is not what you can expect. We know what we can expect. The question is, what are you doing? What, how am I preparing myself to, to benefit from what is happening? And so to the viewers, this is the question we have to ask. So many things happening. Where can I go for information? Where can I go? And there's so many things happening in terms of information and training and building capacity. If you want to get into business, there is so many business support organizations and support you could get. You could go and learn things for free. But you can't just wake up and start a business if you never work in a business. Before you become an, a, a business person or or an entrepreneur, you gotta work first. You gotta be an you gotta be an employee first to understand and learn. And if you don't want to take on the risks of an entrepreneur, okay, what career do I want to pursue? If I don't have a if I don't if I'm not academically driven, then what skills can I learn to enhance my my you know my my earn, earning capacity, my earning potential? Because you have to the country would develop. 
but that doesn't mean you would benefit automatic you would benefit automatically in some in some sense for example Maybe in just public services is infrastructure and so on. yeah the public goods and services you will benefit from anyways but how do you position yourself what skills do i have what skill is needed and what skill do i have that i could invest in and develop to become more competitive so that i could you know, do something good for my life, my family. What I can tell you, Joel, is where, from listening to what you're saying, is where we need to start is better to have no information than to be misinformed. Because if you ask Glenn Lal the same <laughs> question, he will tell you money is supposed to fall from the sky. I kid you not. So if you going to learn from Glenn Lal as how to benefit from this economy, <laughs> it's better you don't learn at all. Because things are going to happen. What are going to happen? If you're lazy, you ain't getting nothing in this economy. I know. I dip on the grind every day. And I'm thinking, I, I spoke to um, directors for one of my companies recently. I said, hey, what no? I want, relax, I want you to think. And then I look at it and realize there are certain things that only I can do. Correct. And I need to be on the ground there. You understand? So, but if you listen to Glenn Al, what's going to happen? You are not going to get anywhere in this country. And in addition to not getting anywhere, it will be agonizingly painful, your suffocation. Because you were told that it would come easy. You sit down waiting. You're going to get stinging nettles. You know what stinging nettles? You just get a bite in your rear end when you sit down too long. So you sit down, waiting, get stinging nettles, and hoping this thing will drop. Now it's better you didn't listen to Glenn Lyle and just sit down and wait and we know that you're lazy and accept that you're lazy. But hoping to get something, you got to go out there and get, and as you said, look and find and figure out how you can better yourself, how you can capitalize on this. Are there work sites opening? Am I going to open a start? And one thing, point I want to note, when you're saying you're becoming an entrepreneur, not everybody can become an entrepreneur. A lot of people get them confused, right? Try it quick, fail fast, and beat out. Yeah. Go and get a job. It ain't easy because continually like meeting guys. Me never stress. Me never. Stress. Me never stress. Well, here what I'm telling you, that is not a term used by entrepreneurs. You got busy. I ain't never the problem. That is the job of an entrepreneur is to find solutions to problems that you didn't even know exist. People assume you can't be trained to be an entrepreneur. You, there, there's no qualification structure for entrepreneurship. You understand? You could learn things. There are parts that you could learn. You understand financing. You understand the mechanics of certain things. Um, you understand technology and IT and everything else. And that helps you as an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship is basically dealing, and everybody wants to be an entrepreneur in the island economy, right? Mm. It's basically dealing with problems. Like the money you're hoping for get from Glen Lal, falling out of the sky, does the problems come? Because as an entrepreneur, they usually realize, I didn't even know that this is a problem. I didn't even know these things exist. <coughs> you just learn some things, and your ability to head, go head on into this problem and solve this problem, that it pays huge dividends being an entrepreneur. Mm. The, the, the irony, funny you talk about Glenn Lyle, the irony about that, while he is telling the people and preaching this doom and all these things happening, he is getting richer by the day. Yes. In As a result same, of position, well positioning. Same, in this same economy, he's getting richer. It's not only the newspaper business. He Even got. forming a political party. Yeah. You know, the country falling apart. Mm -hmm. And he wants to take, who wants something that is no good? Who wants to go after something and nurture something that is no good? He, he wants to be the Donald Trump of Guyana. Remember Don, Donald Trump campaign? Oh, he rich, he's a rich businessman. He don't need to take payment. He can fund everything from his. So that's what he's doing. And he's, he's rich in the same economy. He got other businesses. And on the front of the entrepreneur, you're right. There is, there is a distinction between a self-employed person and an entrepreneur, a self-employed person is not necessarily an entrepreneur. You are still employed. <laughs> you are still employed just for the viewers. You know, I, I was giving, I will close by saying this on the entrepreneur front. I will, and, and, you know, 
in light of what you said, I made this presentation at the Youth Engagement Forum at the Energy Conference, and I said, I asked the, I asked the, the, the audience there, what is the difference between an employee and an employer? And the difference is an employee works eight hours a day, five days a week. An employer slash an entrepreneur, on the other hand, works minimum 13, 12, 15 hours a day, seven days a week, and 24 hours in a day is not enough, and seven days in a week is not enough. Once you learn the difference and you understand that concept, you decide which one you want to be. That's the difference between the two. You got to be prepared to put in the works. Guys, if we could leave anything with you, uh, thank you again for tuning in. And thank you, Joel, for coming over at short notice. I'm hoping this has been interesting. I'm hoping we have lived up to the standards of the Gildarian Freddie Kisun show. And once again, thank you for tuning in.